We're heading east along the coast of the Black Sea, with the Caucasus Mountains rising up in the distance. Ahead of us, our first border crossing into the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. Welcome to the Silk Road Adventure. Georgia is relatively unknown in the West and we feel like we're going to a place where few of our countrymen ever visit. In fact, in 2004, the country saw fewer than 10,000 international tourists for the entire year. Known for its scenic beauty, legendary wine, and generous hospitality, Georgia belongs neither to Europe nor Asia. Coming over to Georgia, you know, it's been a very turbulent uh, last two, three years there, but it solved itself. It's no very peaceful, it's nice. Coming to Tbilisi, uh, it's such a cultural center again. And it's just so different people as we migrate east. Today we are in the southwestern part of Georgia, and uh, this region is called Ajara region and has a population of 379,000. The town where we are now, it is called Batumi, and it is the capital of this Ajara region. We are going to the Guanio Fortress, and it is one of the oldest fortresses in this Ajara region. It dates from the 17th, 18th centuries BC. And from the Hellenistic uh, time, here was uh, uh, not a village, but town. And uh, this uh, fortress was uh, built mainly to preserve this uh, part and uh, to protect it from the northern tribes. And uh, from uh, 1921, uh, uh, this area was uh, controlled by a Russian army, by Russian troops. Georgia gained its independence in 1991. The crumbling legacy of Soviet involvement is readily apparent in the Black Sea port of Batumi. I have not been traveling through this part of the world at least five years. I remember some of the countries being so, I mean, they were blossom. And now they can barely make their living, especially Georgia. It seems to me that they've turned into different people. And they almost forgot whom they were just 10 years ago. And I know they will remember, but they need some help and assistance, I think. Just for wherever it comes from, but just need a, need a help to support the countries a little bit more. Well, I was very afraid when I first came into Georgia because I saw all the roads in the cities having potholes and you know, missing manhole covers and stuff like that. Well, it's a step down on a ladder. It, it's a little bit of a memory I have from touring Russia and Siberia before. I mean, they have to, they really have to start below zero to get over into the hundreds, you know. It's the roads and houses. I don't know if you can save some of the old houses or rip them down. The people trying very hard, and you can see they're friendly enough, and the police help us tremendously. It's not a police state like in the Ukraine. It's, 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 it's nice, but they have to overcome such a hurdle that it is very difficult to do that in a year or two or even in a decade. Until recently, police corruption in Georgia was epidemic. They were taking money uh, and uh, it does not depend you made something wrong or not. They were taking it in any case. But now it is uh, 
in order. Everything is in order, so no corruption anymore. Earlier we had a policeman standing uh, on the roads, but now this system is abolished because we have new uh, police cars. Corruption aside, these are still hard times in Georgia. Young people, they don't have enough money to buy their own house or to rent it because the salaries are not very high, so they can't afford it. And uh, even after marriages, uh, for example, uh, if a boy is mar uh, if he gets married, he lives with his own parents, with his wife. Uh, but sometimes uh, they have money to rent a house or to, to buy the new one. Before leaving Batumi, Helgi is interviewed by a local television station. I think the best people can do that meet motorcyclists or meet other tourists when they see to put on the best uh, face, you know, you show them good hospitality. And uh, if we live with a good impression of your country, I think it has good sure. prospect. Yeah. <laughs> Here in Gori, the birthplace of Joseph Stalin, this is the last remaining statue of the former Soviet ruler. That's just one of many ways of seeing how much things have changed since the breakup of the Soviet Union. In order to make the Stalin Museum on time, I went through a tunnel instead of going over. And when I got to the, through the tunnel to the toll booth, I was trying to get some money out and the three attendants said, you American? I said, yes, I'm American. They said, we love American, go through free, and <laughs> pulled it up and I went right through. The capital of Georgia, Tbilisi, is one of the most ancient cities in the Caucasus. Walking around the city, it's possible to see the intricately carved wooden balconies, which often appear in paintings of the city. Rising up from the river in the heart of the old city, the Nerakala Fortress dates from the 4th century. Yesterday we were at the fortress, the, city, the old city fortress in Tbilisi, and uh, we were climbing around the, the walls, the old fortress walls, and there's a bell tower on top, and uh, uh, Hans had rung the bell, and there is a local lady, an older lady, I won't say what Hans called her, she was like really irate that we were ringing the bell and was like yelling and screaming at us and really animated about that we shouldn't be doing that. But then as soon as we came down off the wall, she was like wanting money and being nice and gentle and stuff. It's just a really contrast. It was kind of funny. It just made me laugh. Unlike the other countries of the Silk Road, Georgia is a Christian country. The Methaki Church of the Virgin dates from the 13th century. <laughs> Rustavelli Avenue is the main street of Tbilisi. As a bridge between Europe and Asia, the culture here is a mixture of both. <music> Despite
Despite the scarcity of Western tourism in Georgia, one very important American just passed through Tbilisi a few days ago, and evidence of his visit is everywhere in the capital. George Bush's speech in Freedom Square made international headlines when somebody in the crowd threw a grenade at the podium. Fortunately for the president, it didn't go off. Our own reception for the Georgians was an over-the-top display of their legendary hospitality as we were treated to a royal feast and no small amount of their indigenous wine. Later in the hotel, the journey turns ominous when we hear news of violence in Uzbekistan. Well, we are here in Tbilisi right now and I've been watching CNN and it's probably the worst thing you can do because you get very focused on the latest news. And in Uzbekistan right now, there's been an uprising in the southeastern corner in Ajijan. And uh, it's very ugly when you look at the news. And I don't want to, don't play what's going on. But of course, I'm a little nervous that that's going to affect our tour. But because if they close the border to Uzbekistan, even though we are not going to this troubled area, uh, that will be, I, I really don't know the answer to what the outcome of our tour will be at that point. With the latest news from Uzbekistan, it was a little disconcerting to hear sirens and see the arrival of so many vehicles right outside our hotel in Tbilisi. What's going on? Why are there so many ambulances? Are they preparing for a demonstration here? Now that the American delegation has left, it's Moscow's turn to court the favor of Tbilisi and win influence in the capital. These shiny new ambulances are designed to do just that. They're all a gift from Russia and that they're um, just a present for uh, Georgia. And uh, I stuck my head in them and they're like, they smell brand new and they only have like 10 kilometers on them. Pretty awesome little rigs. I'm trying to figure out how I can get one myself. It's a long ride each day, and it's sometimes hot and sometimes it's cold. And you know, you sit on the seat, so you know, to keep on going, and it's a mental ride. You have to be totally aware of your surroundings because the traffic patterns are different here than they are in the States. So, it's a challenge. In Georgia, the traffic was just crazy. It's like there's no rules and people cross the center line and come at you head on and things like that. And it's, those are things that are hard to deal with. And uh, no, it's not, it's not easy. It's not an easy way to travel, but it's a good way to travel because it really does, it really immerses you in, in what's going on and what's going on around you. You're very much part of it. If you fall behind, I have seen it before, then you have double the riding to do the next day and to catch up. But, you know, that's part of the challenge, you know. This is a kind of an adventure ride. It's not uh, a luxury tour where you sit on a, in a big cushion in a chair and being chauffeured around. I mean, it's just, you lose some weight too, you know, that's kind of cool. today but beautiful country really nice country road uh, all tree line oh nice and green uh, fertile looks fertile look like they grow a lot here so looking forward to seeing some more of the country lots of animals no pigs the pigs I think are gone until China but uh, sheep goats and cattle dogs on the road. They just want to chase you out of the, uh, away from the livestock. Uh, as long as you don't slow down or stop, I think you're fine. They just want to make sure you keep going. Stoke that baby up. I'm trying to warm up. That's what I'm, that's what's happening over here. 
Kind of a cold, wet ride this morning. It's tradition to offer tea to the guests or somebody. First question is, would you like tea? It's very important that like, like cigarette, like, it's our tradition to offer our guests tea. But you see special form of this cup. This, we call this cup Armudi. Armudi. Armud in, uh, uh, in Azerbaijan language mean, means pear, pear, because this form uh, looks like pear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> For such a small country, Azerbaijan contains a wealth of natural splendor. In fact, the small country contains nine different climatic zones. Riding motorcycles over this misty pass is one particularly nerve-wracking way to experience this zone. But what goes up must come down, and we soon arrive at another historic Silk Road caravanserai in the small village of Shekhar. One of the remaining links to Sheki's rich past is the stone caravanserai building, one of five the city once boasted. This old inn of the Silk Road still accommodates travelers today, with rooms on an upper floor that overlooks an inner courtyard. In the evening, the locals refuse to let us rest and insist on sharing a bullet-shaped bottle of vodka with us. tired of waving at people. <laughs> I'm in Azerbaijan. I'm riding one-handed all day. Leaving Sheki behind, we set out for Baku through the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains and a landscape that rapidly becomes a parched desert. For at least 2,500 years, oil has come out of the ground near Baku to be exported around the world. The world's first deep oil well was drilled here in 1884. By 1913, there were 3,500 wells in Baku, transforming the city into a cosmopolitan industrial center. Today, a lot of foreign companies, a lot of for, foreign, the biggest uh, foreign company, the BP, and also uh, Ramco, Total, McDermott, some companies from uh, USA, some companies from England, even uh, Nobel Brothers come here and work, came here in Azerbaijan and works in Azerbaijan. They had office here and good business, good business, Nobel Brothers, they, ha they had good business in Azerbaijan. Just to put it in perspective, at the turn of the 20th century, i.e. 1904 to 1910, this is where the Rothschilds and the Nobels made their fortune in Azerbaijan. And in those days, it provided, Baku provided 40% of the world's oil supply. So these BP have just put in a new pipeline that they're busy filling at the moment to take oil from the Caspian out here all the way to the Mediterranean through Georgia and Turkey. 
1600 kilometers of pipeline. It's going to take uh, four months to fill this pipeline. 10 million barrels of oil. So is it going to be important for Azerbaijan, this new oil? The answer to that is yes. Is the country going to change? Yes. Are the people good? Yeah, the people are friendly. They're going to reap the benefit of the oil, you know, which is good. You know. Azerbaijan enjoys a premier position on the shores of the Caspian Sea. Its past, like that of neighboring Georgia and Armenia, has been a turbulent one. Various Khanates ruled these lands prior to the 19th century. Russians and the Soviets dominated the region until Azerbaijan declared itself an independent nation in 1991. Although we are among the very few travelers who come here for the history and culture, as opposed to the business of oil, we will enjoy the comfortable improvements the city of Baku has invested in to cater to Western investors. Tourism now is just grows, but not very important for us. The first oil, but tourism, we know that tourism is very important also. This is the oldest part of the city, dating back to medieval times. Narrow, curving streets are surmounted by a high rock wall from the 12th century. The Maiden Tower overlooks the Old Quarter and the sea. With a past shrouded in mystery, it's one of the many architectural gems in the sector. Completing the first leg of our journey is cause for celebration, and a couple of local GS riders join us for dinner. Ben and Phyllis have been living in Baku for several years. I love it here. It's, uh, it's not like real life somehow. You don't have all the same problems and responsibilities you have at home. It's just like one big party, actually. <laughs> Ben's working, I'm not working. So for me, it's like really nice. There's quite a big expat community and we've got lots of friends here. There's a lot of good Western style restaurants. So you can eat Azerbaijan food or you can eat Greek, you know, Indian, Thai food. There's a restaurant, every nationality, food you can eat. We've got friends from all over the world. Here there's no problem, yeah. The people are friendly. I'm sure you found in Turkey, everybody was friendly. Georgia, people were friendly. But at the moment, probably your only problem might be Uzbekistan. But I'm sure you'll cope with that, you know. Yeah. You'll find a way around if necessary. Yeah? With Central Asia looming ahead, it's time to reflect on the past and how far we have already come on the Silk Road Adventure. Uh, it, it's amazing. It's like I thought the people in Turkey were perhaps the most cordial people I'd ever met. And progressively, I think they've, be, they've, they've become even nicer. And not maybe immediately, on first glance, I hear they don't look at you with a smile right away. With you, but the moment you say something, the moment you like engage them, they're just that much more kind. And, um, so Azerbaijan's been really cool. I mean, unfortunately, we came in through rain. There's some brutal riding, some tough roads, some really tough roads. I think it's taken a toll on some of us. But um, I mean, it's incredible, you know. The, Again, just the stark contrast, moving into Georgia, moving into Azerbaijan, it's like contrasts are getting even harsher. But for me, it's more incredible that way, you know? I don't know, it's like, I, I, hate, I hate to say it, and it's like, I almost want to just push the fast forward button, which you don't want, but it's just like, I just want, I want to like engage all of it. I want to like, you know, just get it all happening, so. It's going to be interesting. The adventure will continue. The highlights of the Silk Road Tour, I think for myself, is going to be getting to Turkmenistan. 
It's definitely, it's been a bottleneck in this whole project. Uh, we have even reject, have had uh, one of our participants rejected this year to go through Turkmenistan. So we have to fly him around and our uh, backup driver will take the bike. But it's all these uncertainties in a Globe Riders Tour that makes it unique. I don't know of anybody during the entire Silk Road in 53 days on motorcycles except Globe Riders. So I think it's evident as you go on this adventure that you are kind of charting a new path for the last 50 years or so. It just hasn't been that much travel all the way through here. Leaving Baku in Azerbaijan, go crossing the Caspian Sea, it's not the easy feat because it's no ferry there. You cannot just go up and say, yeah, I would like a ticket for the 10 o'clock ferry. Oh no, we have to rent part of the ferry. It's a lot of stuff going on in the background. So we may be doing something that few people are, are, are doing in the post-Soviet era, and that's going across the Caspian Sea. We are almost there now. This signal here is the boat. We are going to the strait here. So it's going now 20 kilometer, 19.9 kilometer an hour. And that means that they have fired up boat engines. We've been coming down the coast here, and actually we have uh, Turkmenbashi right in here, but, and the hotel should be right, I can almost see the hotel. And if the captain can go in there and put us off on the beach, that could be great, but we do have to go through the strait, very narrow, shallow strait into Turkmenbashi. It's fantastic to have one of these GPSs, not only to navigate by motorcycle, but you can have fun also and kind of keep an eye on what the uh, big dude captain is doing. Well, I'm figuring out right now that, that we're, we're heading west instead of east, um, heading back where we came. So kind of wondering what's going on, whether decided that we can't fit through, we've got to go around or what's going on. Go down to the bridge and see what we can find out. There's a large oil tanker coming through the, uh, the shallow channel that we're going to go through. It, the channel is only 1.5 meters deep. We'll like miss the bottom by about five feet, but there's a tanker coming from the other direction. So we've had to turn back around and go out and do a holding pattern until that tanker comes through the channel. And then this is why we're making this large sweeping turn. We are actually heading back west two minutes ago, and now we're swinging south and then heading back east, and then we'll go through the channel. So we are not lost. We are not, point. well, that's... You feel confident this is okay? The boat's not lost. We, however... Another story. Uh, pretty exciting. We're watching a death gauge over there. There's uh, 1.6 meters of water underneath the bottom of this uh, ship. Which is only about, what, five feet? Five feet of water or so? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they're letting us have uh, full reign of the uh, instruments in there. Of course, when John tried to touch something, they slapped his hand a little bit. <laughs> Great fun. One of them even speaks some um, little bit of English, which is kind of nice. Between I and Tukmenbashi, short Tukmenbashi, 32 miles. What is this? Ship. Ship. Oil. Oil. Oil rig. Oil rig. Oil platform. We're gonna land in Tukmenbashi and go through customs, and that could take hours. But I, I'm not really afraid or anything of that. It's just, you know, just another thing you deal with. And, uh, but I, I, I mean, you hear that there's all the rooms are bugged and uh, listening devices and people follow you around and everything. And I'm sure that's probably true. The fact that this, there are things to overcome on this trip, like anything in life, makes it that much sweeter. The fact that, yeah, in the middle of the night, we're sitting at the customs trying to get into Turkmenistan and wondering, what the hell is this place anyway? You know, and it's two in the morning and how many more forms do we have to fill out? That's part of what makes it an adventure. With the rocky shores of Turkmenistan in the distance, the 26-hour ride across the Caspian Sea is almost complete. And we will soon be in a country known as the North Korea of Central Asia.
After a long night of customs procedures, we're released to this posh hotel in Turkmenbashi. The city is named after the president of Turkmenistan, who chose this name for himself when he came to power. This hotel is perhaps the most opulent in the entire country, with both outdoor and indoor pools. Too bad we don't have any time to enjoy it. Leaving the plush air-conditioned hotel for the searing heat of the desert, we head out for our first day of riding in Central Asia. Only a few miles into our travels, we stop to take photos of the first camels we've seen on the Silk Road adventure. In the distance, a young camel herder watches us from a hill. When he has seen enough, he ventures down to round up his herd, undoubtedly surprised by our interest in his animals. He, thought, he probably told, thought we were going to steal them. As much as 90% of the country is covered by the Karakum Desert, a vast wasteland of sand and bush. This is the hottest desert in Central Asia, and few people attempt to eke out a living in such desolation. And we're here at the lovely local mobile station. So how much does a, a full tank cost? Did it cost you? Uh, I think it's going to cost me around mm, 60 cents, something like that. The currency here is the monet. The best exchange rate is always on the black market. And this money changer sold gas, changed money, and gave us tea. Even here, a little negotiation goes a long way. Next. Yeah. <laughs> we got 40,000, huh? Oh, how much? 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, <laughs> Before we left, our host offered to butcher one of his goats for us. So how much does it cost for a goat in uh, America? How much for a goat? I've never bought a goat, a goat in America. <laughs> you can, probably, you one can one. probably buy a good goat for... I can tell you how they go for the hour. bucks, hundred bucks. <laughs> Can we get one by the hour? <laughs> you know, the, the physicality wise, and just in, enduring you know, sore backs, or the first few weeks, my throttle hand uh, arm was getting really cramped up. That stuff you just endure. You know, it's, it's funny, it's like there'll be times where I'll be riding and you know that there's something like, uh, you know, wrong or something's like you slept on your back wrong or something. You just forget about it. You just like, you just endure it and deal with it. And I think that the kind of the breed of people that we are is like, that's what you do. Like if you've got a big cut on your foot and it hurts like a bitch, you're going to start riding. You, know, you just got to ride in and who cares? The frustrating days. It's hot, tired, hungry. I mean, there's been days where it's like, I just want to go home. And I usually realize it's because I need to eat or take a nap and it goes away. I mean, I'm really happy to be here. But I do realize that that's the part that nobody talks about because we don't want to seem ungrateful to have this amazing opportunity. We are, we sort of like we always have to put up the face that everything is great. And it is a great trip, but there are certainly moments. Uh, Ashgabat is uh, situated on the uh, Great Silk Road, uh, which started the first century uh, AC, and uh, it was a small fortress. Uh, since that time, all the trade routes and the caravans were passing by through this, uh, this, uh, this small fortress, and then uh, all the trades from Russia to China, it was like a linking, uh, like a linking place for uh, travelers uh, of east and west. Now, 
uh, as many people, as many guests and tourists say, uh, they you know uh, they see the, our marvelous city. It's uh, it's uh, the beauty. It's white, and uh, we now we used to say Ashgabat is uh, like it's a marble city. Oh, I like Turkmenistan a lot. I could fill the 35 liter tank for 50 cents, uh, which was a lot more than other people were spending. But compared to the eight dollars a gallon, I put almost a. I don't know, 90 lira worth, like $85 worth of gas into the tank when we first got it out of the container. I, I think the political difference between oh, Turkmenistan, where you have this egomaniac, this megalomaniac, which on every coin, every dollar bill, every building, if he's not in gold leaf, it's a big picture of him up there. He thinks very highly of himself. And yet at the same time, on the flip side of that, it was probably uh, Ashbogat was probably one of the most beautiful cities. This city of marble, gleaming palaces and fountains in the middle of the desert is the creation of one man, Sapper Mirat Turkmen Bashi, the self-proclaimed father of all Turkmen. In the middle of the capital, the Arch of Neutrality, one of dozens of monuments he has erected in honor of himself. There's even a monument for his book. Consider these books, uh, his books, as a second Quran. So, like a very sacred book for uh, our nation. Other countries come and uh, like appreciate it. So we uh, get uh, a lot. We learn a lot, and we, this is a guidance for us. So we just follow this book, and uh, under his guidance, uh, we hope this. We call this 21st century uh, as a 21st century is a golden century of Turkmen. So. As uh, you have to come, come down to Ashgabat to uh, just uh, realize it. And uh, like as you have a saying, you know, uh, wake up and smell the coffee. So you just come in here and see it yourself. City is very nice and uh, many people amazed by uh, looking at the greens uh, and plantation around it. So uh, uh, traditional Turkmen people are very hospitable. So you can see people on the, on the streets, you know, when you walk and uh, they're all friendly, they uh, strive to help assist and uh, uh, it's in our traditional way and it's coming from ancient times our hospitality and uh, we are welcome to everybody coming here so uh, uh, just offer our assistance so that's a little bit about Ashgabat it's just a whole nother world Ashgabat it's God I don't know how you can explain it to somebody without without actually taking them there and just showing it it's just unbelievable <laughs> We get an early start today to experience the Oriental Bazaar, one of the most vibrant and largest open markets in Central Asia. Uh, one thing is uh, which Ashgabat is uh, very uh, uh, different, in, uh, like indistinct, is uh, Ashgabat has a big uh, outside Sunday market. We call it push market because of people, it's very crowded, it's very, you know, uh, big. Now, uh, it's, uh, it has uh, uh, sections, uh, so you can find their uh, animal section, so where the livestock, poultry, camels uh, and uh, cows and, uh, are uh, displayed so for the sale. And uh, there are there is another section called uh, the carpet uh, and ethnographic section, so there you can find everything uh, from the carpet, from uh, uh, the carpets to you know, other uh, pieces of art, of national art. Uh, made in Turkmenistan uh, and we uh, beside this uh, the market uh, uh, now I mean to these days recently the market works you know even three days a week uh, Thursday Saturday Sunday so it's not far from the city it's uh, like a half an hour drive um, and uh, there is a good parking lot uh, so uh, People have opportunity there to bring their uh, goods and products, and uh, like from the outside of the country, from the rural, from uh, so. Uh, and there is a good facility for them to sell it. And you know, for your information, uh, in agriculture we have uh, practically no pre no taxes from the government side. It's uh, it's open and it's made to uh, make the private sector to develop. So, uh, local farmers uh, living on the skirts of a city they bring their goods and they pay only for the seat where they sit it's and it's uh, it's like five thousand manats per seat per day it's uh, it's uh, one dollar by the state rate mm -hmm. Yeah, 
It's somewhat uncharted territory right now for a traveler. But it's pretty self-evident as we go through that people are just stopping and looking. Uh, they haven't seen many Westerners in some of these countries. There are so many strange places that we go, that, like Turkmenistan. Nobody go there. I don't know about any organized motorcycle groups that ever went through there. And being a photographer, this is going to be I'm going to no film this time. It's all digital, but I'm going to take gigabyte after gigabyte of pictures. <laughs> It's great to be able to travel the old Silk Road route, but I think the biggest part of it for me was being able to travel through countries that uh, are new and you 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 don't understand these countries you don't know anything about them really so you get a first-hand look at a new country and then they're changing so rapidly they're not going to be the same in another 10 years so it's great to be here and see them as they are now you're seeing so many different cultures peoples countries ways of dress. So I think it's evident as you go on this adventure that you are kind of charting a new path for the last 50 years or so. It just hasn't been that much travel all the way through here. One of the highlights of our visit to the Sunday Bazaar in Turkmenistan, the camel market. For centuries, camels have been the beasts of burden on the Great Silk Road. They're still used in Turkmenistan for their labor, food, and milk. And every week, families from the surrounding region come here to buy and sell camels. Wheeling and dealing to get the best price is standard practice here, just like any other purchase in this international bazaar. Sometimes the hardest part is simply getting the camels home. Being with an organized group, uh, with uh, Helgi as uh, a world traveler, I put a lot of trust in his knowledge and it has certainly proved to be uh, very good. And when we eventually did get into these countries, it was not at all what I expected. These people, again, uh, took us in uh, with open arms and um, I never felt uneasy uh, at any point in time. In deciding to come on this trip, um, I questioned whether or not it was a smart thing to do just because of where it was at. And um, a lot of my friends and family did as well. The fear is almost in not knowing. The fear is almost, well the fear comes from and is, is derived from not understanding fully what it is and where it is that you're going. So. Um, now being here and now getting so close to the end, I mean, I can't imagine not coming to these places. I can't imagine um, these places being the kind of places that will, would frighten people. If anything, the complete opposite is true. I mean, people have been cordial to a fault. I've never seen more people laugh harder and, and, and it, it be more expressive and, and, and just wonderful. <laughs> 
Oh, okay, very good. Right. We'll see you, bro. Right. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Our guidebook mentions the large lizards in the Karakum, also known as desert or land crocodiles, and we're hoping to see one on the road today. And that's exactly where we found it. Did you see a picture of it in the book? Yeah, they said it looked like a... a it was real flat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it had guts hanging out. <laughs> The Silk Road adventure for me has, has been a historic journey, a cultural journey, and a geographic journey. And, and that's just been outstanding to, uh, to read about things, to read about historic events, uh, back ancient events, the Hittites, Alexander the Great, to, to have read about Genghis Khan before and reread it again, to read about Tamerlane. I'm not mistaken, we have over 4,000 four, uh, 4, historical places and archaeological uh, sites to look at and very old. So our, uh, our history starts with uh, like 7,000 years of history we have. So starting from the ancient times, so, uh, the uh, Neolithic period, so then the Stone Age and Bronze. So even that time the people in, uh, just inhabited this area, so we have a long tradition, long history. Merv is one of the oldest ancient oasis cities along the Silk Road in Central Asia. In the 12th century, Merv was the capital of the Seljuk Empire, which extended into Iran, Afghanistan, Syria, and the Caucasus. In ancient times, there was a big complex consisting of five cities with walls that were almost 100 feet high now in ruins. 150,000 people lived in ancient Merv, and the city boasted 12 libraries, 11 madrasas and mosques, and a post office that used pigeons to send the mail. Looking out across the ruins here today, it's difficult to imagine the scale and complexity of what was achieved in this oasis. Several important museums are in the area to preserve the artifacts found at the site, along with various aspects of traditional culture. I think it's important to read as you go through the, on the trip. You want to go back and reread Travels of Marco Polo. You want to read The Foreign Devils on a Silk Road to understand some of the things that, are, that have actually gone on. Central Asia is almost the origin of many parts of, of Turkey, many parts of India, Iran, that people came out of Central Asia. From a standpoint of variety, it's just more to see as you go through this amazing road called the Silk Road. For more information on the Silk Road adventure with Helge Peterson, including the live journal for this and other Globe Riders adventures, please visit our website.